the idea now is to have a discussion on, on these questions and issues that Professor Kraus brought up in his lecture. Why is there something rather than nothing? And is science uh, what we need to explore these questions? Or do we need some other kind of explanations? Um, let me briefly introduce the panel, and then I will ask each person uh, in the panel to comment on Professor Krauss' lecture, just three minutes each, and then Professor Krauss obviously will be able to respond on that, and then we'll have a free discussion. But let me first just present the, um, the panel. We have Stefan Gustafsson, a theologian, a lecturer at Credo Academy in Stockholm, um, his general secretary at the Swedish Evangelical Alliance and the author of several books about Christianity. And then we have Ulrika Engström, a science journalist and writer. She has recently published a book about the history of astronomy and she also works for the Swedish television with the program Vetenskapens Värld, The World of Science. Uh, and then we have Professor Krauss, you already met him. And we have Åsa Wikfors, professor of philosophy at the University of Stockholm. She's among many other things researching on the relation between mental states and the external uh, world. And finally, we have Bengt Gustafsson, astronomer, professor of theoretical astrophysics at the University of Uppsala, also a Christian believer. He's also a science writer with a book called Cosmic Kresa, right? Yes. Cosmic Trip. And uh, maybe some other things coming up in the future. We'll see about that. Uh, so, I'd like each of you first comment on the lecture just, you've just heard. Maybe we should start with you when we just go through them. The okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the book. Oh, you're I think it's a very useful one. Uh, if you look in Swedish language, we don't have anything correspondent. I think in, in English you have a few others like... John, not as good, though. Not as good. <laughs> Although John Barrow has written quite a nice book yeah. about nothing, too. Um, I think that um, this, uh, this progress in, in cosmology in, during my lifetime has been among the most fantastic things I've seen. Uh, and we know very much more now than we did some 40, 50 years ago. And I'm even older than that. Um, however, I have, when reading your book, I get an impression that very much of this is due to the effort of a number of, of individuals. It, to me, it's a bit romantic, like the 19th century heroes, you know. And there are some very nice, nice anecdotes, and there are uh, adjectives like brilliant and these kind of things, and then these names. Um, and I'll just remind us that much of this is due to thousands of engineers in particular, also other scientists, uh, developing detector technologies, de developing rocket technology, uh, steering of great telescopes, adaptive optics, whatever, lots of things. And I want to stress this because it's often not stressed. So, so I would beg for your next popular book to give a plea, more of that, to this crowd of people on which we actually built. These are the necessary conditions for what we have achieved, I think. Um, th then I must say that I um, have a problem, and the problem is concerning what is certain, what is a guess, or a good hypothesis, what is a guess, and what's more kind of... A wide extrapolation. And this is a difficulty in all popularization, so I, I understand that. Um, but still I fear that one may sometimes go too far. Let's take one example. The omega, which is about one, plus minus, as you said, one percent. So. One percent, yeah. Yes. Um, but it could be 101. 101. It could be 099, and maybe you wish actually a closed universe, a little bit closed. Uh, it's 1.0000000000001. That's what he wishes. <laughs> but uh, 
it's not clear from what you have written that there is this uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, it could well be 101. Mm -hmm. And if it is, uh, this argument which you repeat several times about no energy needed at all is a bit more in danger. Uh, That's why it's not the case. <laughs> you say, and, and this, is, this, is, this is very interesting. Theorists, they know it has to be say, zero as regards lambda, as regards to the cosmological constant, or one as it regards omega. Well, if you are a little bit more empirically inclined, you prefer the measured data, and you are accurate to say we shouldn't extrapolate yeah. too much mm -hmm. on the basis of our guesswork. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's a, a kind of general okay. feeling. Then I have one more problem. Okay. Uh, and that problem is indeed interesting. I hope we can come back to that. And that's the hypothesis of very many universes. It's a, to me, it's a metaphysical hypothesis in order to explain why our universe is as it is and is so special in a sense as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is we can't see them and the uh, question is if we have any good ideas how to see them. Mm -hmm. And if we can't, it's, it's, it's a, to me, rather, I would say, not only difficult, but a kind of spooky idea. Okay, it's I'll, true uh, metaphysics. Point. I'll try and address that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we let uh, Professor Krauss answer or respond to all of you at, in the end. So, yeah, yeah. So, what's that, please? I'm just taking notes so I can Yeah, do you want a bigger response. paper, maybe? To I have notes. a little piece of paper. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Okay, okay. I get it, I get it. Krauss, please. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the philosophers have been giving you a hard time, I hear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> only, the, only the bad ones. <laughs> only the bad ones. So let's see. Who shall I be today? Exactly. I'll be a good philosopher. Good. Thank uh, you. All right. Well, uh, I mean, let me try this then, because it's interesting, I think, that the philosophers all have this reaction. And, uh, and you know what the reaction is. So the reaction among philosophers, there's been some reviews and there's been a discussion, is that this is really false advertisement, because he's not at all answering the question, why is there something rather than nothing? He's answering the question, why is, uh, is there something giving very little stuff, very, little very few assumptions, why is this universe here? Um, which is uh, a very, very interesting question, the philosophers will say, but it's not the question we wanted answered. Um, and so in the book, Actually, I think some philosophers haven't really paid attention because in yes. the book there are three steps, there is, which was clear from the lecture here. There is nothingness number one, which is this very minimal sort of quantum field of fluctuations, which we have these wonderful images of, of the sort of energy going on there. That's not nothing um, for a philosopher, of course, because nothing is the absence of everything, including quantum fields. Um, but then you have step two, which is um, the idea that you can create it from, even without those assumptions you have, you can create space, and maybe even time. Assuming the theory of everything, however that's gonna look, uh, and that you have a quantum theory of gravity, and you say, we don't have that yet, but if we have that, we could maybe get this. And then philosophers have said, well, that's not nothing either, because you need the laws of physics, and you need, why is that particular theory that gets you this story true at all? That's, that's the next question they ask them. Um, and then you say, wait, 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 I have a third, I have a third step in my book, and that was also very clear here, which is, um, well, the multiverse. So why are there the laws of nature that we have? Why are the, the constants the way they are, and so on? Well, it's just so happens that there, there, there is this multi -universe, multiple universes, and in one of them there's going to be this kind of situation, and that's the only one where we will find ourselves, and so it's the only place where we can ask a question. And then philosophers have said, well, that's not nothing. <laughs> um, that's multiple universes and assumptions about laws. And if, not, if the laws are accidental in this universe, you will need meta laws that steer the, uh, un mm -hmm. the laws of, you know, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not going to be content. Uh, we're going to keep pushing this question. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering now, do you, do you think... Are we pushing against nothing? <laughs> are, we, yeah. are, we, are, we, are we, is it a pseudo question? Some mm -hmm. people will say this, well, look, it's just a brute fact. At some point, there's gonna be a brute fact. It's gonna be eternal universe, eternal ur matter, what have you. Is, 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 it, is, it, is that what we have to say, or should we even say something stronger? This is all nonsense. We can't even think about nothing. Thinking requires thinking about something. We can't even formulate these questions. Parmenides had that idea, that is, you can't even, 
So is the philosopher up against a wall, or is the philosopher, in fact, thinking about a very deep question, which is perfectly legitimate, but it's not one science will ever answer or even care to answer? That's my question. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ulrika, what's your comments? Well, uh, you said some of it. It is because of this, the argument that we are living in this universe because we wouldn't be able to see another universe. So it's just uh, by chance and lucky we are here. Uh, because, but that's the same, say, not asking about what I'm, I'm coming from because it's just a look, lucky accident that Ulrika Engström was born once a time. And then you can go further and think, why should Newton ask about gravitation? Because he's just, he can understand and see it, but ask, continue to ask questions about uh, what's behind it. So it's, it's like stopping and don't stop asking questions. And that's too, too easy, I think, to do that, because then we wouldn't have any science at all. So why stopping there? It's, it's almost like a religious way of thinking, because you say, otherwise you can say, okay, we can't know anything more, we say there is a God, or we can't, mm -hmm. we can't say anything more because then, uh, because uh, then we, we, we shouldn't be here to watch it if it wasn't like this, and then, then we are final with that quest. So, so that's my major thought mm -hmm. about it. Okay, okay Stefan. Uh, <coughs> welcome to Sweden. Thank you, Professor Kraus, and uh, thank you for a very uh, stimulating lecture. Uh, I have actually three, uh, three questions oh, that I look forward to discuss. Uh, <laughs> the definition of nothing, mm -hmm. the definition of knowledge, and how to build a human culture. <laughs> so first the question, what is the definition of nothing? I've, I've read um, your book, A Universe from Nothing, with great interest, but I've not found the nothing that is uh, promised in the title. Mm -hmm. Instead, it seems to me that Professor Krauss in the book is redefining, redefining nothing to always mean something. In the book, nothing has properties and is described as unstable. Uh, so it's, it's always something. And uh, this something becomes increasingly immaterial through the book. That is, that is true as if this gradual move towards the immaterial justifies the conclusion that literal nothingness is the cause of the cosmos. I got a feeling that it's like arguing that since it's possible to live by less and less food each day, it must be possible to live on no food. But I don't think that conclusion is sound. So I agree. I have the, a, a similar question <laughs> as, as Awasa. We need to, to define nothingness. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the, the view of knowledge. If I have uh, understood Professor Krauss right, he claims that the only knowledge we have of the world is empirical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he is, for example, uh, denying the self-evident principle out of nothing, nothing comes because, quote, it has no foundation in science. Mm -hmm. Now, that is true, it does not have a foundation in, in science, but none of the laws of logic has a foundation in science. Mm -hmm. Instead, science must presuppose those laws of logic. No. So it's somewhat a surprise for me to see that Professor Krauss holds on to the principles of logical positivism, it seems to me, which says that we should only believe that which can be scientifically proven which is a self-refuting position, since the pr principle itself cannot be verified by science. So this is the second question. Don't we need a broader view of knowledge? Mm -hmm. And thirdly, just short, how to build a human culture. Uh, the tagline for the, uh, tonight's discussion in the ad was, and we heard it here from the stage, we are more insignificant than we could ever have imagined. Now, I totally agree with Professor Krauss that truth uh, is, of course, the goal, whatever we feel about that truth. But still, I, I couldn't resist reflecting on this gospel of the new atheists <laughs> to whom Professor Krauss belongs. For 2,000 years, the Christian gospel in that, in that has group, formed our culture, saying to every new generation, you are much more significant than you could ever have imagined. My question is, what will happen with a culture that for 2,000 years will say to each new generation, you are more insignificant than you could ever have imagined. That was my three questions. That's the greatest Thank gift you. we can give to people. So, Professor Krauss. Wow, okay. 
Okay, I'm going to try and go through these things in, in, in order, and it'll be good to end with yours, because by then I'll be very rude. Um, <laughs> your first point is incredibly well taken about the, the fact that science is a collaborative enterprise. Of course, when you write a, when you write a history, you pick up... You, uh, you, people like to hear about people, and so there are, and there are certain key people. But science is much more collaborative. In fact, we make the mistake... I try not to, in fact, in my writing, but uh, to m make it appear as if science is done by great leaps, and in fact, science is done by baby steps. Little baby steps. Every, and the problem when you read newspapers and read about science is everyone is Einstein. Every week, someone is the new Einstein. And it's not the case. Science is progresses by baby steps, building on what's been done before, they're very rarely leaps, and, and even those leaps are not done independently by individuals working alone. They're dependent entirely on not just the engineers and the vast number of people working there, but by the, by the collaborators. We do. I do science. I, I, I do it. I like to think I do it, and I do it by, by collaboration by, with students and postdocs and colleagues around the world. But in fact, that is the part of science that's worth celebrating that I usually try to. In fact, I... I, I think I do talk about it in the book in this way, but I always try and talk about the fact that science is worth celebrating for precisely that reason. Science is a human activity that demonstrates what's possible, how to overcome barriers of culture, language, religion. You know, and the example I often use is the Large Hadron Collider, which is a good example, which is, in my mind, as I've often said, the, the Gothic cathedral of the 21st century. Because... You know, the Gothic cathedrals were built for over 100 years by thousands of artisans working in dedication, family, and on and on. Well, the Large Hadron Collider is built over, over decades by thousands of physicists from hundreds of countries speaking dozens of languages, having many different religions, but they all speak the same language as science. Science demonstrates, and it's the only area of human activity, in my opinion, that demonstrates that people can work together, that that people can work together to a common goal. And therefore, science is a wonderful example of that collaboration of, the, of, of individuals working each with their small part towards a, towards a, a, a common end. And, and so I think the, what you said is very, very important to stress. And if I didn't in the book, I should do it more often because I do it, I try to do it in all my writing. It sounds like you're itching to say something. May, may I fill in a short question? Do you think it would be proper to give Nobel Prizes in physics to full groups? That's a good question. I think we're going to have to see what happens in the next uh, uh, Nobel Prize, which is, I, I'm betting will be given for the Higgs particle, although we have a bet over there in the front row. But someone else knows better than me. Um, and the question is, well, I mean, there's, it's the first example I know of where, where if you give it for the experimental aspect of the discovery of the eggs, you can't give it to individuals. And so it may indeed be the time to give up giving it to individuals and give it to groups. It would be a dramatic shift. It violates the will of Albert, Alfred Nobel, but then every year they violate the will because it's supposed to be for the, for the result the year before. It's never the result the year before. So uh, it'll be an interesting question. I think it would not make... It would be a... It would be... A, a reasonable thing to do, because as science progresses, fewer and fewer things are being done by individuals. All science is becoming big science, because the easy problems are done. The hard problems require big projects, not just in physics, but in biology, the Human Genome Project, in climate change, in every area. It's requiring huge collaborations, and it's hard to single out individuals. So it would, it would make sense, I think. But, okay, anyway. Um, I'm, I hope I'm not taking too long to no, answer. No, no, okay. please. The metaphysics is an interesting question that, that I think some people may have, so it's worth going on that. Are these multiverses metaphysical? Um, the answer is, if they were, it wouldn't be worth talking about, okay? In my opinion. I'm not a big fan of metaphysics. Um, less of a fan of theology, as we'll get to. But, uh, but metaphysics at least has some content. Um, uh, um, the, the, okay, it's all right. I'm playing to the crowd. But um, the point is that it, 
it sounds like you'd never be able to discover the existence of a universe that wasn't in our universe, and that's, pretend, that's true. Except here's the way I think you could turn into science. And it isn't science yet. It is speculation. And by the way, I think, the one thing I take umbrage with that you said is I try extremely hard in the book to make the difference between what's speculation and what's based on evidence. I think it's very, very important to do that. And I try whenever possible to say, this is speculation, this is evidence. But anyway, so here's the way I would see turning it into science. If we had a, a theory of inflation, which we don't have, by the way. We don't have a good, th good based on fundamental particle physics. But let's say we had a particle physics theory that explained from first principles why the proton is 2,000 times heavier than the electron, why there are three generations of elementary particles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as part of that theory, inflation occurred naturally. It had to have occurred in the early universe. Now, inflation generically produces many universes. It's a property. In fact, you can calculate, if you had a theory of inflation, you can calculate the process of internal deflation. So the point is, you could have a theory that could make 100 predictions, 99 of which are testable. And one of the predictions is that there are other universes. And you might say, look, if it, it, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So that I can test so many aspects of the theory that those aspects I can't test, I really think are reasonable. So that's the way I think it could stop being metaphysics. Much like, for example, the existence of atoms was accepted long before we had electron microscopes and to be able to see them. There were so many independent predictions of the atomic theory that were vindicated by, uh, by experiment that you accepted that aspect even though uh, you couldn't see them. So I think that, that, that and that's an important direction. And if we can't go in that direction, then it will just be talk. And I agree with you, it'll just be talk. But the other thing I should say about it, and it maybe relates to some of the things we were talking about, in fact, something you brought up, and I'll bring it up now, is the difference between the, the multiverse which, by the way, is probably eternal, so we'll get to this question of cause and nothing, is the difference between that and God. I mean, call the multiverse God if you want, but the difference is it's well-motivated. Well, God is just giving me a hand and say, I don't understand it's God. I, I, don't want to, I want to stop thinking it's God. The multiverse is something we've been driven to, not by answering this question something from nothing. We've been driven to it by particle physics. We've been driven to it, some of us kicking and screaming, because I don't even like the multiverse. But, and, but, but if, whether I like it or not, as I point out, the universe doesn't exist so I can like it. If, it, if the evidence tells me it's likely, and at this point I do think it's likely, then I can live with it. I'll have to. And so it's well motivated for reasons completely different than explaining the origin of our universe and providing a context to answer this ridiculous question that the philosophers ask. Okay? So anyway, so it's well motivated. That's my point. Now let's get to the question, which is the question of interest. The question of interest to philosophers is precisely the question that has absolutely no interest. To you. Yeah, to me. <laughs> And that's why it's really, I'm really thrilled that the philosophers are interested in it, because they can go on asking their questions, and we'll go on making progress. And, um, and, and so, um, the point is, look, this, que it is a question, look, ultimately, is there an uncaused cause in the language of where you want to pick it, you know, St. Augustine, Aristotle, you can pick your choice. And, and, and and the simple answer is, if there's a multiverse, it could be eternal. In fact, it's quite likely it's eternal. Now, you might say that's not nothing. But the point is, that's, who the hell cares about that? The really question of interest, the question that's really important, is not this question of whether you can take causes back to etern you know, ad infinitum. The question is, how did we get the universe we see with all this stuff? That's the miracle that people have been asking about for as long as humans have been asking questions. That's the miracle that seems to require a God. And, it, and what I point out is that our universe could begin from nothing. There was no universe. Now, was it embedded in something? Maybe. But who the hell cares? The remarkable thing is it did not exist. It didn't exist. There was nothing, no aspect of our universe that existed. No space, no time, no matter, no radiation. None of that existed. And it 
could have spontaneously popped into existence. In, albeit, a bigger object, which may have me, the multiverse, which may be eternal and may be something. But that's not the interesting question. The interesting question is, how, did our, could our universe have arisen from absolutely nothing without any, any purpose, without any intention, without any, a, a, any intelligence at its cause? And that is the question that I think is so fascinating to ask. That's the question. And it's really the question, again, I repeat, is not why, but how. How could a, a, a universe big enough to house us and 400 billion galaxies arise when there was no universe? And that's the question I try and answer. That may not be the question of interest to philosophers, but I point out that I don't give a damn. <laughs> that that question well. is not of interest to me. The question is, how did our universe come into being? And can one understand by physical effects what the processes might be. I will agree, and I even say in the book, carefully, that this fundamental question of cause and cause and, and is there an uncaused cause is, is left open and not addressed by physics, and the multiverse may address it in a real way if it's, infinite, if it's eternal. In, and as I say, in a much more well-motivated way than God. But it, 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 is a, it is a question of interest to philosophers, I agree, but it's not the question that the physicists want to answer. And, and, you know, and it really is nothing. I take umbrage at this notion. When, when each of those electrons emits a photon that shines on your beautiful face, not mine, <laughs> that photon didn't exist. It wasn't there. It wasn't hiding in the electron. It wasn't hiding in the atom. It was spontaneously created. And people don't have any problem with that, that that photon was created from nothing. It didn't exist before it was created. What, what, I, what, what I try and show is that that can be true for our whole universe. And moreover, if you ask what would be the properties of a universe which was so created, it would have the properties of the universe we see. That's all I say. And in fact, I don't even answer the question. I just say it's plausible. So let me, so let me say Professor that, Frost, that question that's of interest to you is not the question of interest to me. To get to the yeah. final thing. Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah. Um, so your question of, in some sense, luckiness is what I tried to say. The multiverse isn't invented to make us lucky. It was invented, it was developed because we we're driven to it by our theories of inflation. And I think le in a less motivated sense by string theory. But inflation automatically predicts the multiverse and... And you can't help but have many universes. But that, but that was, wasn't my question, was it? No. Well, I just, I mean, you know, if I, I, it, 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 it is luck, it may be luck, and that's just the way it goes. But Well, it, but it's a way not have to ask more questions because we can't... Uh, it's like that's the great thing about science, is every answer begs more questions. That's think, why it doesn't end. But I think it's, it is a question that not goes the way to ask more questions because it's like being satisfied with, okay, it is like it is. No, 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 it's not satisfied. That's the point. Okay, I remember here. The point is that we, we don't, don't invent it and say we stop asking questions. We want to say what is the theory that predicts if there is a multiverse and what's the probability distribution of universes and can we test these ideas and if we can't, then we call it impotent. So we really want to try and understand the theory that makes predictions. We can't make them yet. We're nowhere near doing it. But if we can't, then it, then it's. I agree with you. It's complete, a complete but, mental but, masturbation. But, but as like, uh, where is the fundamental constants coming from? Why are they like they are? Well, and as that's, I say, that's a question we must be able to. But we might be able to. Here's something we might be able to do. Okay. First of all, there might be a fundamental theory. I'm not giving up. Mm -hmm. I still work <laughs> on it. Okay. Hold on. I want to get to the but before we before we really get to mental masturbation. I want to I want to get to that. Um, sorry, but I can't help it. Um, <laughs> We, here's, some, here's one way, for example, that you might say you actually get an answer. Let's say in the landscape of string theory, for example, you found that there were many different universes, but there's a correlation between constants. The only universes that, for example, have a small cosmological constant, a small energy of empty space, also have three generations of elementary particles and four forces. Let's say that you found that was a correlation. Then you'd say, aha, then maybe there's some evidence that... that, that that we're picked out, because in order to get this, you get that and that and that. If you had a probability distribution, we don't, and we're nowhere near it, but it's a possibility. In which case, you'd really be able to make interesting predictions about 
the parameters of the universe based on one observation. So we must find a universe like us because. Well, we have, but your, your point is, the really important point, and this I try and emphasize in the book, and it's really an important point for philosophy, philosophy and for theology. We are stuck with one universe. We, there may be questions we can never empirically answer. I, under, I accept that. Because we're stuck in not only one universe, we're stuck in a universe 14 billion years after the Big Bang. As I point out in the book, and I didn't talk much in the lecture, it, had we evolved 10 billion years earlier, there may have been other observables we could see. And 100 billion years from now, there may be observables we can't see now that we could see then. We are stuck as products of space and time. And we have to live with that and make do. So there may be questions we will never empirically answer. And that's just the way it goes because we happen to live in one universe. And there may be, and you know, medicine, everyone knows you do epidemiology with two patients. But, but that's not the way science works. With one universe, you can't determine a probability distribution, and there'll be limits on what you can say. Let me, let me, um, let me go to the, your three points, or maybe at least two of them. I, um, as I pointed out in my book, it is true that theologians may find problems with my definition of nothing because theologians are experts at nothing. And... Um, and... Um, and... Uh, I, I, I believe you didn't find nothing because you weren't looking for it. The, def, the theological definition of nothing, in my opinion, no matter what I write, because I've been doing this for years, and before I wrote, is nothing is that from which only God can create something. That's the theological definition of nothing. And any nothing I come up with won't satisfy them because it could be created without a God. To me, as I say, a universe that didn't exist before it existed is a universe from nothing. Now... Did it come from something greater than our universe with laws that transcend our universe that might be eternal time? Absolutely, that's what the multiverse is. But my point is, unlike God, the multiverse is well motivated. Now, when it comes to knowledge, let me make a point that I, I don't know if I said in the book, but I want to make it quite clear and it's really rude. But it's true, in my opinion, because I've gone around and asked theologians. A lot of, I talk to the, believe it or not, I spend a lot of time talking to theologians and I was saying, Give me an example of a contribution to knowledge in the last 500 years from theology. Because I make the claim that theology, which I don't think should be a discipline in universities, has made no contribution to knowledge in at least the last 500 years. So I say, give me an example. And every theologian that I've ever asked has given me the same answer. What do you mean by knowledge? Now, that's an interesting answer. Because if I asked a physicist, or a biologist, or a psychologist, or a historian, or an economist, they, they wouldn't say that. They'd say, here, here, here. So the bottom line is, I just don't think knowledge, the only knowledge that matters is the knowledge that comes to us from the universe. And the knowledge that, that we create in our own brain is usually wrong, which is why all the knowledge from organized religion is all always the doctrines of all organized religions are in contradiction to what we observe in the universe. And as I said earlier today on some, I forget what program I was on, most people who call themselves religious, including the people in this room who are religious who I've already offended, aren't if they call themselves a Catholic, they don't really believe that, that when a priest holds a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ. Come on, they don't really believe that. They don't really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale and lived. They throw out the crap they don't believe because it's nonsense. And they like to, what they want to believe, they believe in believing. So people call themselves Catholic or Christian or Jewish or Muslim because what they do is they throw out the things they don't like and they keep the things they like. That's because they want to believe we're hardwired to believe in a divine being, I think, for many good evolutionary reasons. The last thing is culture. Science can provide a culture which is far healthier than the culture that's been provided by theology. Because it is based on reality. And it in fact involves morals which are laudable, unlike the morals of all the world's religions, which are despicable. If you read the Gospels, they are, in my mind, not worth living for. And as my friend Christopher Hitchens would have said, I would rather, as he would have said, he's not an, an atheist, he's an anti-theist. 
He would not say with absolute certainty that there is no God, but what he would say with absolute certainty is he wouldn't want to live in a universe with one. Who would want to be a sheep with a cosmic Saddam Hussein? Who, who doesn't, okay, now, yeah. who doesn't <laughs> we'll let... condemn you just for your <laughs> lifetime, but condemns you for all of eternity for the temerity of not believing in him? I would not want to live in such a universe. Well, okay. here, here was a, a lot of red herrings, which has of nothing to I, do. Of yeah. course I would. You, you yeah, are just distracting from, from, from the issues we are discussing. So well, you, you, uh, I do not have a theological definition of nothing, but a philosophical. And I think it's really, what is your uh, definition I think of it's really annoying that you are dismissing philosophy as a discipline. At the same time, your own presentation is loaded with philosophical assumptions. Okay, look, and I just, you dismiss metaphysics, no. and then you speculate about multiverses, which from the beginning is speculation, and then suddenly it becomes well, I'm glad probable, and then becomes likely. And, and no, no, no. Look, look, you're right. Your point is, it, uh, you make on, an interesting point. Let, let me just let, respond. And, no, no. Your, your point is well taken. I do dismiss certain aspects of philosophy. I just was in Oxford debating some philosophers, and here's the key point. You're absolutely right. A lot of what I'm doing is philosophy, if you call philosophy critical thinking and analysis. But my point is you don't have to be a philosopher to do that, and the philosophy doesn't add to the science. The only way to learn if there's a multiverse is not to decide in advance if it's logical or sensible or, or deductive or inductive or, or whatever, is to try and figure out if the universe tells us it's actually there. So my point is that the philosophy, of course we're doing philosophy, every one of us does philosophy every day, if we're critical and logical and trying to, you know, and, and ask questions about the universe. Philosophy is good for asking questions. Science is good for answering them. What's that? Uh, yes, thank you. That's all you wanted okay. to say. Uh, well, I was trying to be nice and a good philosopher, but um, first of all, of course, all, I mean, I have to make a comment about knowledge because, of course, the foundation of your science is mathematics, and that does not come from the universe. That's a priori. You rely on a bunch of a priori mm. reasoning throughout your science, uh, be it metaphysics or not, but there's certainly mathematics and there's logic and there's all that. Now, why some a priori reasoning should be cut out uh, a priori, as it were, uh, from your uh, world view, I don't get um, at all. Uh, it's a, it's a it, it of course, it, of, and it's of course, I'm not surprised to hear that the question that interests you is the scientific, scientific question. It should be. You're a scientist. Yeah. The question that interests me is the philosophical question. I think that's all good and well as long as we have many questions and they may not be the same question and that's fine too. Maybe you uh, propose, which I think you do in the book, you propose that we redefine the question why there is something rather than nothing. And that's fine. I think it's an extremely interesting story. That do you, you agree tell. with me about the fact that why is a bad, that why No, I think there's a causal why. I think there's you, no you, implication. It applies no purpose. purpose. No, the it minute doesn't. you ask no, why, it, no, it applies it purpose. No. You really mean how if you're being causal. Well, you really say, you know. when, if you say why, you really mean how. Why can be construed costly, that's fine. I don't What do you mean why if it's not how? Why did the window break? Well, well you know, there's, the, the, you're not. asking how the window breaks. You're not assuming there's some purpose in the window no, breaking. No, of course not, but why does not imply purpose? Anyhow, I think there are all sorts of legitimate questions to ask here and to rule out the philosophical ones a priori, the way you're doing. That seems to no, me no, 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 very no, dogmatic. I think, oh, well, I, think what pe I think what you're assuming is when I'm, well, <laughs> applaud. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not ruling them out. I'm just saying they don't interest scientists. Of course And not. they're irrelevant for learning about the world. Sure. The point is that philosophy has, in the, has been a very useful discipline in asking sets of questions. And what inevitably happens is that, the, that science, the domain of philosophy, shrinks. Right now, one key area of philosophy that I think is interesting is moral philosophy, for example. But the reason it's interesting, in my opinion, is that we don't yet have a complete theory of mind. If we did, I would argue that moral philosophy would once again become subsumed in neurophysiology. So, but I think the, 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 the philosophical question that you're asking is unanswerable, and that's why philosophy, that kind of question in philosophy, doesn't make progress. There's a lot of philosophy which says, let me interpret the results of science. Let me interpret the results of quantum mechanics. Let me try and understand what it means 
for humans, or let me put in a logical context, let me, those kinds of philosophy I think are very useful. But what I take umbrage with is a philosopher's telling scientists that you won't understand what you're doing unless you ask philosophical questions. Because empirically, it's just not true. No scientists read philosophy. No scientists read the philosophy of science, and they get along fine. And so it may be pedestrian, it may be parochial, it may be small-minded, but that's, but it's somehow explaining the universe. But maybe it's that for you, physicists miss the big question because there is a big problem in, in, in cosmology right now, and maybe it's because, or, or do you agree that the, the cosmology or our worldview has a big problem to... Well, there's a lot we don't understand, if that's yeah. what you mean. I mean, I don't know if that is a big problem. I don't think... I mean, to, to try to quantum physics with gravitation, for example. There's oh, a lot we... huge question we don't know, not, not even near to well, answer. That's what makes it May exciting. But maybe that's one, one reason for that. Maybe it's because you missed some kind of questions. Could that be? Well, I mean, there may be questions we can't answer. But I don't think they'll be answered in philosophy. I don't think we'll come up with a theory of quantum well, gravity. Well, if we can't problems. answer them, they won't be answered in philosophy either. Yeah, That's yeah, for yeah, sure. yeah. But <laughs> I think the point is that we, when it comes to the universe... By the way, I disagree with what you said about mathematics. You're absolutely right. We use mathematics. But it's not as if mathematics is reality. I can create many different universes with mathematics. In fact, as a theoretical physics, physicist, that's what I do. And most of the time, I'm wrong. What does that mean? It's not my math. Some of the time, my math is wrong. But most of the time, what, that, what I'm saying is that I can create an infinite number of mathematical universes, but that doesn't determine reality. What determines reality is going out and finding out which one we live in. Sure, so it's not the math, it's the experiment. And you need the proper math to do the calculations for the universe. To, 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 yeah. to compare it with, but it's the experiment that determines it. And I do agree with you, I am limited. If you can't empirically measure it, it isn't knowledge, in my opinion. But that, 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 is, that is a very problematic, a problematic view. I, I think it's, uh, your it's, whole approach works, here though. that a scientist is, uh, is not studying philosophy or philosophy of science is deeply problematic. Your, your view of knowledge has been discredited uh, decades ago uh, uh, amongst epistemologists because yeah, it's, we, it's but incoherent. Yeah, but we've the universe. It's, it's incoherent because you, you have to assume a lot of things that you cannot prove by science. So what? why have an incoherent what? epistemology? Well, 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 well look, look, first of all, most scientists can't spell philosophy. No, and that's um, a problem. And so none of them read How it. can you revel but, in but, that? So, that's but, a so problem. All, so I agree, we're all ignorant philosophically. But, but my point is... And proud of it? Despite... Well, some of us are proud of it, but actually I have actually read philosophy, so I just try to okay. put on that hat. But, but the first book that got me interested in physics was a book by Sir James Jeans called Physics and Philosophy, actually. But the point is, I'm an empiricist, so my empirical proof that philosophy is irrelevant is no scientists know anything about philosophy, but look what's happened. In spite of the fact that we don't know anything about philosophy, or at least we don't read philosophy, we've been able to discover all these things about the universe, create vaccines, figure out uh, uh, the evolution of life. So somehow, the ignorance of philosophy hasn't gotten in the way. For that. Let Bengt uh, yeah. say something. Uh, Bengt. I'm trying to be provocative in case it's not clear. <laughs> You're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's late at night, I'm trying to keep away. Well, I, I have a couple of questions related to this. First of all, I would like to state that I'm, I have personally a high regard of philosophy, although I also think that science has the right and even the obligation to transgress the philo philosophical uh, ideas uh, which are currently around. And science have often progressed by really questioning basic philosophical principles. That's fine with me. Um, but then uh, I'm curious about your view on mathematics because certainly mathematics is a tool and certainly this tool often predicts unreasonable universes, you would phrase it, if, if you just mm. use it without any empirical basis. But it's also interesting, as you know, that mathematics is able to make quite interesting predictions of phenomena that we didn't even think of before. Um, and, yeah. you know, you, this famous uh, uh, essay by Eugene Wigner on... Yeah, the, the unreasonable effectiveness, unreasonable effectiveness of, mathematics. of mathematics. Yeah. So what is mathematics? 
Well, you know, it's a, I actually wrote a whole book with that in mind, about extra dimensions, because it is a fascinating question. Humans are hardwired to like certain things, including extra dimensions. The question is, what is a product of our minds, and what's a product of the universe? Mm -hmm. And, and is mathematics a product of our minds, or is it a product of the universe? It's a fascinating question. Philosophical question. It's a fascinating yeah. philosophical yeah. question, I agree. Ooh. And asking Ooh. the question is very interesting, but it doesn't... And it, so it's an interesting <laughs> philosophical question. I'm, I, I think you're presuming that I'm not suggesting that there aren't interesting philosophical questions. There are. But to presume that those philosophical questions are scientific que interesting scientific questions is incorrect. All I'm saying is the interesting philosophical questions nowadays are not, in, 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 at least in the case of the physical sciences, not interesting scientific questions. So that's, that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But, 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 and, uh, but I just want to point that out because there are some philosophers who think that they are. But this question of is mathematics intrinsic to the universe or is it a creation of our minds is an interesting question. I, th uh, the, I think the point is that we have... To, it's, it, but what, what it is, how is an empirical discovery. Mm. We've discovered empirically, not from logic, but empirically, that this language works. So the discovery that mathematics works is an empirical discovery. And the discovery that it's a language of nature tells us that it is somehow extrinsic to us, that at least the relationships that, we, that have been invented in our minds model well the way the universe works. But that's an empirical discovery. But I, I think the... the the really important thing to realize is that it is that empirical aspect that's important. And I close one of my books with a, with a, a statement by Hermann Weyl, who's a mathematical physicist. And it proved he was more a mathematician than a physicist, because he said, as you know his famous quote, he said, in my work I'm often ch forced to choose between the true and the beautiful. And whenever I'm forced to choose, I always choose the beautiful. And that's why he was a mathematician. Because as a physicist, I'm sometimes forced to choose the true, even when it isn't very beautiful. Can I ask you, uh, I think that Stefan had a point which I don't think you really have answered yet, and that is, even with your naturalistic worldview, you have to make certain metaphysical assumptions. What? For example, that there is an external world, not only in your head. For example, that the laws of uh, logic uh, doesn't lead to contradictions. Well, they do lead to contradictions. So that's my point is we can't rely on logic. We can't rely on classical logic. We have to check to see if it works. For example, no, but what quantum the mechanics what tells us that classical logic doesn't work. And in fact, yeah. the question of the cause and effect goes out the window if time goes away. But what but I for mean example, is if, that the what if time began when the universe mm. began, in what sense can you ask about a cause when time did not exist? So we have to redefine those very notions, and that's okay. That's what learning is. I understand, but still, uh, still, couldn't you agree with what Stefan said that you have to, uh, you have to uh, I don't have do to make certain assumptions well, look, which no. are not um, uh, testable with well, insight? I think I can to look, do science. No, I, I, yes, I find no. myself defending Stefan's position here. Which well, is in some vague not, way, not usual. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, no, but in some vague way. But I think in a kind of facile way because you know it's true i cannot look i can't prove i can't prove there's an external reality i can't prove we were here three seconds ago i can't prove we weren't all created a half a second ago with the memories of my obnoxious remarks okay and so i can't prove that so i can't i can i can't prove that but my point is if you if, if you if you if, you can argue that that's possible, but then I just say, stop, then give up. I can say, let me ask what's likely. I could say that God created the universe with this incredible, three seconds ago, with this incredible conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And I could say that's possible, but then what's the point? I can say, let me act as if that's not the case, ask questions as if that's not the case, and try and probe the universe. And for example, as we were talking about today, I think I was talking to you, I was also talking to another journalist. It could be that Stockholm is an invention of my mind. But I find that highly unlikely, and that's all science can tell us. Science can't tell us what's true or what's false. It can tell us what's likely and unlikely. Mm. They, it's they, highly they, uh, unlikely that there's a god. It's highly unlikely that Stockholm is an invention of my imagination because I don't think my imagination is that good. 
the, I the don't reason. Think I, the, I'm not an architect. I couldn't have created the beautiful buildings I walk around this week and look at. So I think it's highly unlikely, and I act as if it's highly unlikely. And lo and behold, when I act as if it's highly unlikely, I come up with predictions that are good and allow me to make tests and allow me to build technologies that make the world a better place. Stefan, But, <laughs> Professor Kraus, the, the reason why you can't ignore philosophy is that you're doing it all the time. You, you cannot avoid it. You are philosophizing the, the whole evening here. Sure. Making, yeah, and why, why then say it's, uh, we should avoid it, it's not important? The I only, say the only choice you have is to be a good philosopher Or a bad one? No, my uh, choice to be a good scientist or a bad actually, my but, choice is to be a good person or a bad person. But you cannot be a scientist without using philosophy. Th yes, but you can't be a human being without using philosophy. I agree no, with that. No, so therefore you shouldn't ignore it. No, no, Th but that's all the I'm whole saying, point. the different. Uh, let me let me repeat what I said. And it's all began, by the way, and this is reminiscent of this debate I had at Oxford when I taught at Yale uh, University many years ago. Yale was going to get rid of its philosophy department. And well, they I, had reasons. And they had reasons. It was a crummy <laughs> philosophy department, I agree. But, but then I started to think, hey, that's not a bad idea. Because could you, let's take the really good, let's take the people who are in a philosophy department. Well, they're logicians, but they could go in the math department. There are people who look at the history of ideas, but they could go in history departments. There are classicists, who, they could go in classics departments. And the point is, what is unique about philosophy? And... and I think philosophy is important to, as, a, as a teaching tool because it is one way of teaching kids critical thinking and logical analysis. But, it's not the, but, the, but I don't think it's an essential way. I believe I could do that in a physics department or many other departments. So philosophy is an integral part of all disciplines. It doesn't, you don't have to be a philosopher to do philosophy as your point. Oh. Uh, the only philosophy I need to do is not the philosophy I learned from Kuhn or Popper or any, although I read them all. I learned the philosophy of science from Feynman because I learned how science is done from scientists. And, that, and all other scientists I know to first approximation did that. So my point is it's that the, the rigorous discipline of philosophy is of interest to philosophers and may be useful to teach students as an example of how to think. But it's not useful for scientists, that's all. It's not What's useful. That? What do you say? Oh, well, yeah, no, not everything we do is useful for scientists. Yeah. This is true, <laughs> but not everything other disciplines do is useful for your discipline Absolutely. either. Absolutely. Uh, philosophy, you must not know much about philosophy. The philosophy is a very big discipline. It's a huge there's discipline. epistemology, there is philosophy of mind, there is metaphysics, there is semantics, there is you know, so on and so forth. These are huge disciplines, these are growing disciplines, there's a huge accumulation of knowledge. Do you think it's a growing discipline? Absolutely. It's There not a shrinking discipline? Absolutely not. <sighs> What keeps happening with philosophy, of course, because philosophy, philosophy was the first way of thinking about the world. Absolutely. Yes. So it expanded, and we got more sophisticated ways of thinking of the world, and parts of that way of thinking fell away from philosophy. Absolutely, okay. First we got physics that fell away. Fine, wonderful, okay. it became its own discipline, empirical, Yeah. Discipline. Fantastic. Then other things fell away. Psychology, maybe the latest in 19th century. Maybe logic will fall off into yeah, mathematics, yeah. or maybe they, you know, who knows. That will keep happening. But there's going to be philosophy, nevertheless, because there are these very, very general questions that the specific specialized sciences cannot have the time to address. I agree with you 100%. And, and philosophy will have to do that. I agree. Whether it's useful for, to you personally, I don't know. Or to no, no, science. I agree with you completely. It is useful to knowledge accumulation in the world. I agree completely. I absolutely, I couldn't, Good. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I'm uh, fascinated by knowledge. I happen to find the history of science more useful to me than philosophy. But, but, but I think you're absolutely right. And people should, I tell students, they ask me, what should I do? I say, whatever interests you. If these questions interest you, do them. Yeah. And, but all I'm objecting to are those philosophers who tell me, I can't do science if I don't know philosophy. And, I, and you're absolutely right. Physics has dropped away from philosophy. The questions of interest to physicists are not philosophical questions anymore. Okay, Ulrika and then Bengt. Yeah, I must ask you, because now we have discussed theologians and, and, and philosophers, but I also hear that you have some problem with string physicists. What's, well, that's their what? philosophers. To some what, no, what's the yeah. problem? <laughs> Why? No, I don't have a problem with string physicists. Let, let, let me, that's also They're been sitting out. in Everything, the bag. I mean, they're in the back, so it's okay. Um, Why? No, the point, what, I've, what I have a problem with is hype. Look, so string theory, I wrote a whole book about string theory. It's the only 
only fair and balanced treatment of string theory, as I like to say. And that in my country is a network called the Fox News Network, which is anything but fair and balanced, and they call themselves that. But um, so the point is, string theory is very well motivated, and I try and explain why we've been driven to that. But my point is, it hasn't done anything. It hasn't shown anything. It hasn't predicted anything. In fact, the more we understand it, the, the more we understand it, we don't even know what its predictions might be, even if it could make predictions. That does not mean it's not worth doing. I have had some, of my, some students who are now eminent string theorists. As I point out, I, so my, some of my best students are string theorists. I just wouldn't want my daughter to marry one. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, so the point is, what I have a problem with is the string theorists who claimed that they have a theory of everything. And moreover, most people in this room have heard of string theory when they don't know the details of the real science that actually describes the universe the way we work. So I have a problem with hype in science, people making claims that are unfounded. And so the problem with that is it comes back and bites you in the butt. Whenever you make unfounded claims of what science can do, and I try not to, and I try to point out the limitations of science whenever I can, there are questions science can't answer. In case I didn't make that clear, there are questions science can't answer. But whenever science tries to make, go beyond the domain of empirical validation, then, people, then it's wrong. And then people start to distrust science. So they look at string theory and they say, look, scientists are just theologians or philosophers. They're inventing these universes. There's no tests. So science really isn't science. And so that's the problem of misrepresenting science. So I do think string theory is worth some people doing. I, and, and maybe one day it'll make progress. It just hasn't made any yet. Bengt, what's your comment on string theory? <laughs> um, well, at least it provides you with very many universes. Uh, One and, possibility, yeah. although inflation does it more effectively. Yeah, I mean. indeed. But uh, I, I would like to ask that again, return to, I think, Ulrika's question here. Um, I mean, the point with advocating this great ensemble of universes is that we get a kind of natural explanation why our universe is such a nice place to live. I'm not in. sure. We, by the way, I don't no, think no, we do no, get no, natural no, explanation. I think that's, that's hype too. That's, I think that's garbage. Yeah. Yeah, but it, man, many people advocate this. Yeah, of course, but they're not thinking philosophically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but maybe then you have answered my question. My question is, if you start advocating that kind of explanation for why our world is as it is. Uh, to me, it seems like the old uh, Kipling just so stories, you know. Yeah, just so, yeah, no, you, I agree. You find an explanation for everything related to our existence, and, and it's, a, in a sense, a rather shallow explanation compared to the level well, of... Well, it's not even an explanation. The point no, is, people of. claim it's an explanation. It's not. Yeah. It's based on ignorance. Because if you had an explanation, you wouldn't need the anthropic principle. Exactly. And, and, every, and the other thing that's worth pointing out is it's, it's been applied many times in the last century to things we didn't understand, and it's always been wrong, because we've always understood that. That doesn't mean, by the way, that it might not be true. Yeah. But it is really important to point out that this claim, I didn't, which I didn't make, I said it may be that the energy empty space is the way it is so we could be here. However, you can show that that lies on tons of assumptions which none of which have any empirical validity. So that you can actually show under a different set of assumptions that the, that the energy of empty space should be something quite different. We don't know what the variables are that, we don't even know the space of variables, much less the probability distribution. So we can't do science. Okay. And, and, and the, based on the anthropic principle, and people who claim they do are really overstating the case. Okay, then we agree. But that, then my follow-up question is, um, what, hope do you have in us understanding nature and the basic concept, including constants of nature and all this, within the concept of the universe we live in? Without well, you, advocating this other I mean, words. I live eternally in hope. Um, yes. That's why I do science. But I think, I think as long as we can, every time we open a new window on the universe, we're surprised. So as long as we can keep opening windows, which guide our thinking, and not from internally, but externally, then we will continue to get a better picture of things. And I do not think there's any impediment to understanding questions that now seem like, as I say, the questions we're talking about now, I couldn't have written my book 30 years ago. 
I, we never would have, I would never have dreamed 30 years ago that we would be able to even address these questions, even if we can't answer them, that we'd seriously address them as cosmologists. And I think, for example, if we did have a good particle theory, which could happen from the Large Hadron Collider, we could have a theory which would tell us exactly how inflation happened in the early universe, and then we'd have a predictive theory for many universes, and that would be amazing. Now, was, am I betting it's going to happen? No, but it's possible. And so Let we got to keep trying. All we can do is keep trying. And, stop, and the minute we stop asking the questions, the minute we turn off the machines, then, then, we, then living... I mean, to me, the value of science is not technology. It's the ideas. It's the very ideas that inspired philosophers and theologians. It's the ideas that are fundamental to our being. Why are we here? Where are we going? What are we made of? And science addresses them in the same way that art, literature, and music address them. It forces us to reassess our place in the cosmos. The minute we stop asking those questions, it's not worth being human anymore. Okay, we soon have to end this, but Stefan, you asked something. Yeah, I, asked something. Um, uh, I think uh, an, an open-minded person needs to reflect on both uh, how questions and why questions. And, and we as human beings... Uh, Uh, we search for answers for a lot of questions that science cannot give us specific answers to. The, um, uh, the underlying worldview th that you have seems to me to give very bleak answers to the, the, the human situation. You know, we, we are very insignificant and our future uh, is miserable. I, I saw on the Free um, Tanker website there was a, uh, a video on your dialogue with Richard Dawkins. Uh -huh. uh, recently, there's a new it, movie coming out. Watch okay. it for theaters and it, it near you. Ended, it ended with a question from the audience, someone asking, "Do you believe in free will?" And of course, coherently uh, from your worldview, both Richard Dawkins and you said, "No, we we don't." And and that's another area where I have a lot of problems with. Well, you didn't the, hear my the, whole answer. Then. The uh, the worldview that's behind your presentation here, that there is no God, because then. The, this whole discussion, if, if my thinking and my arguments are just caused by physical events, and, and what you are now going to say in your arguments is just determined. Why are mm. we sitting here to discuss if I we don't have freedom? I don't um. think your worldview is doing justice to the reality no, well, of the human Well, that's because I think situation. you're not giving my worldview justice. But, and, and here's the point. You're absolutely Short right. Answer. If you look at it one way, it's bleak. Now, what I did say was I don't think there's free will, except the universe acts as if there's free will. I think deterministically I could determine the positions of every particle in this room and what's going to happen, but I'll never know. So the world is so complicated that, in, that effectively or operationally we behave as if we have free will. It's indistinguishable from a world in which there's free will. Yet I know the fundamental equations, which are second-order differential equations, are deterministic. So the underlying equations that govern reality are deterministic, but the effect of the world that behaves as if we have free will, so I do think people take responsibility for their actions. But That is the point. To me, the worldview that I present is far less bleak than the worldview that you present. Because you present a worldview where we're sheep, where the morality is determined by this external, and what's valued is determined by some external I have not being. had a chance to present well, my I, worldview. I, okay, but okay, you're right. I shouldn't say you. <laughs> The worldview, in fact, you're actually right. It's, a, it's presumptuous of me to say it. The world, because you're not a sensible theologian, and there are some. But, but the worldview of organized religions is that there is an imposed meaning and purpose that's defined outside ourselves. But I find a purposeless universe to be far more inspiring and far less bleak. Because it means the meaning in our lives is the meaning we create. It's not imposed on us by some other entity. It means that But we are, are here... Determined. Oh, let me finish Then what I'm impo It's imposed on you. You are determined. No, 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 no. I told you, I effectively act as if there's no free will. But ultimately so, you are determined. Ultimately, the laws of physics determine my existence. Yes. But I find myself having a consciousness and an ability to use it. And therefore, the meaning in my life is the meaning I make. And the quality of my life is the quality of my actions. And therefore, I find myself an ins being an insignificant being in a purposeless universe to inspire me, to say, look, I'm here for this little bit of time. I should make the most of my existence and make meaning in my life by the meaning of my actions. And the, the, it, I find it far more humble 
to take that than to assume that the universe is made for me. And that's all. Okay, we actually have to uh, end here. Uh, this panel made my job very easy. I didn't have to do much. I'd just like <laughs> to ask Osa actually to make some kind of closing remark and then A we'll... philosophical summary. Oh. Exactly. Please. Well, let's celebrate knowledge of all kinds. I agree. Yes. Philosophical, f science, you know, physical, physics, knowledge of physics, biology, so on and so forth. Let's celebrate that. Let's sort it carefully from what's not knowledge, from what's not based on evidence. And perhaps when it comes to the question of being, perhaps we have to accept that, as William James, the famous American philosopher, said, we are all beggars there. Maybe that's the bottom line when it comes to that one. I'll buy that. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>